Thanks, Bradley. Um, so today, basically, we're talking about existence um, and what it means to exist and how things exist. Um, so the title of my talk was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Um, and so I believe we're going to play some of that just to get us in the mood. Picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. A girl with a light that's go back. All right. So here's my question Does Lucy exist? Yes. I have people saying yes. She exists and she doesn't exist. I would say she exists differently for different people. Okay, uh, answer, she exists differently for different people. I'm just repeating for Zoom. Any other responses? Does Lucy exist? Yeah. Oh, Lucy exists in dependence on diamonds in the sky. Okay, does Lucy exist with diamonds in the sky? Let's put those two together. Does Lucy exist with diamonds in the sky? Yes. I have a yes. Why? She can't exist without the diamonds. She can't exist without the diamonds. Okay. So Lucy is dependent on the diamonds. Any other responses? This is a song. <laughs> Lucy doesn't exist. It's a song. Well, that's, it's a metaphor. Well, that's not true. Okay. Yeah. Susan's having a memory here. Parker said that it was a picture that was drawn by his daughter. So it's a picture that was drawn by his daughter. His, and the daughter said, is Lucy in the sky with diamonds? So McCartney's daughter said, this is a picture that I drew, and it's Lucy in the sky with diamonds. We're not talking about the picture. We're talking about the song. Are we? Yeah. The singularity. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, in science, apparently that means I just don't know, and that's okay. What else? Oh, you do know? We don't know. We don't know if we know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's a drug reference. <laughs> yeah. For sure, it's a drug. Oh, does Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds exist to someone who is not able to hear? Is it still a song? That's a good question. Um, any other responses? Any responses from Zooland? Let me check my chat here. Uh, it's a song about LSD, the drug. I believe that's Zima. But, okay, so we have a whole bunch of ideas about how Lucy exists. Does Lucy not exist? I want to hear someone say that Lucy does not exist. Lucy Any takers? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't Lucy exist? No, I was just saying it because you want to take notes. <laughs> okay. So when we start talking about the two truths, conventional truth and ultimate reality, there are different ways of looking at things, or there are different perceivers of things. And by perceiver, I mean different mental states, different consciousnesses. Just depends on who you talk to. Even within Madhyamaka philosophy, there's debate about this. So if we start with Nagarjuna, uh, fundamental wisdom of the middle way, Nagarjuna lived in about 150 to 250 CE. So a long time ago. And basically the idea that Nagarjuna put forth was the middle way, was the Yamaka view. Uh, okay, so the comment that the audio is a bit rough, it could just be my voice and I'm very sorry about that. Um, so Nagarjuna said that 
things depend, uh, things have dependent arising. And that both selflessness of sentient beings and of phenomenon uh, is what brings out the difference here. So when we say that something's empty, and most of my talk is basically going to be some definitions and some discussion about what the texts say. Emptiness means no inherent existence. So Lucy doesn't exist on her own. We can't say that Lucy exists distinctly by herself as a separate entity. But then there's also dependent arising, which says that based on our mental confabulations, our consciousness, our ideas, that Lucy has an existence because we give her existence. Um, and if you read Nagarjuna uh, and some of the commentaries, especially Buddha Palita, who I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, um, you get a sense that uh, we're not talking about effects when we're talking about ultimate existence, the existence of something that is how we know things exist and why things exist and what that gives to us knowledge wise. So emptiness, things not existing on their own, is something that's actually um, the lack of effects and causes. Um, let me get into something that's a little bit more uh, tangible. So when we talk about two truths, we're talking about knowledge and how we know things. So then we have to have what is valid knowledge? How do we actually know things? And this can lead us into a whole other uh, tangent. But let's talk about permanent things and impermanent things first. So a permanent thing is something that doesn't change and cannot affect changes. An impermanent thing is something that can do work. It can function. Okay. Generally, what we're going to talk about with conventional things are things that function, things that we think are actually real. And within our philosophical tradition of Galupas, yes, they are. Conventionally, there are things. Ultimately, there are not. That doesn't mean that they're impermanent, or that they're, sorry, doesn't mean that they're permanent, that they're not changing. It just means that from their own side, the book, it can't exist alone. It can only exist with us. And that's our conventional truth. Our ultimate truth is that there is no book. We can't find the book. What makes the book? Causes and conditions. Well, what are these causing conditions? Well, if we avoid which Nagarjuna is very clear to, to define, we need to avoid an infinite regress of causes and conditions. Well, the tree made the book, the printer made the book, the person who cut the paper, who bound it made the book. But if we keep looking back and back and back to different causes and conditions, we get an infinite regress and that's not acceptable philosophically or logically within the tradition. I know this from Dharma Kirti. So, Nagarjuna's position is trying to take the middle way of saying that it's not that it doesn't exist at all. It's just that it doesn't exist from its own side. It has no inherent existence. What Nagarjuna says is, whatever is dependently co-arisen, that is explained by emptiness. That, being a dependent designation, is itself the middle way. So when we think about reality, from Nagarjuna's point, we think about the middle way of this exists because of everything else that we have going on in our minds. We only see the book because we have the conception of a book. We have the idea of a book. We have the impression of a book. But if we actually look at the book itself, it's not there. It's not findable. So Buddha Pulita, this commentary actually, um, actually takes on uh, the way in which Nagarjuna really defines these things. So we're talking about with Buddha Palita, um, uh, a difference between uh, Prasangika 
and Svetlana Tatra, and I'm going to, my voice is not going to let me do this. So if we're talking about how things uh, state a consequence that's sufficient to refute the, let me go back. With Nagarjuna and Lucy, Lucy exists because we allow her to exist as a song, as a piece of art. So Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is an existent thing. It's something that we hear. It's something that we have conceptualized in our minds. But if we talk about Lucy as an individual object, Lucy doesn't exist. There's no inherent existence. There's nothing from her side that allows her to exist. So that would be the difference between the ultimate truth and the conventional truth, at least when we're talking from Nagarjuna. Buddha Palita takes on how Nagarjuna takes on, or takes a lot of Nagarjuna's argument and brings it forth into um, how we refute that, or if we need to actually state an entire different uh, thesis statement. So the way that the argumentation happens. We talk about Chandrakirti, and Chandrakirti lives in the 17th century, or 7th century. Um, Chandrakirti is going to say that we actually need to think about the two truths, ultimate and conventional truth, by the way that the mind looks at it. So there's different ways that we can talk about this. We can talk about conventional truth and ultimate truth by the object or by the mind that comprehends it. Um, if we're talking about the object itself, we're talking about something that could be false or something that could be true. So our false impressions would be the object is false in itself, that we're not able to actually ascertain the correct object. We talk about it from the mind's perspective. We're talking about a mind that is either falsely apprehending something, such as an imagination or uh, an illusion, or we're talking about um, a mind that is truly recognizing what its object is as it is. So there's different ways of looking at this. If we think about Lucy again, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, was that just someone in a hot air balloon with the stars? Um, are we actually dealing with an existent reality that has some effect from our mind? Such as, I see a book, someone else sees something different. Could this be a box? It's shaped like a book. So our ability to apprehend the object correctly actually makes a difference in how we're able to understand that object and understand her reality. Um, I'm going to stop here and ask if there are questions because... Questions? Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say uh, like ultimate Okay, so the question was, could I actually talk more about ultimately you cannot find the book? I am using ultimate in that sense in the ultimate versus conventional truths. So we have two truths. We have the ultimate existence of things from their own side, or we have their conventional reality or mundane reality, how we actually interact with things. And to answer that question, we actually do need to know what school of thought and what um, lineage we're talking about. So if we talk about Chandrakirti, then we actually have a question about whether or not the ultimate inability to find the book is from the object side or from my mind side. And that comes down through Sankapa and um, uh, Garampa, where the object that is apprehended could be false or giving us false impressions. That would be some kappa saying that, no, there's two natures. It's both there and not there. And it has both uh, together. That when we say this is a book, some is going to say through Chandrakirti, interpreting Chandrakirti, that the book is giving us the impressions of book through our senses, 
But the book itself also has this ultimate nature of not a, being there inherently. It's not a book in itself without any of our interpretations of it. If we look at Garampa's explanation of Shantakirti, Garampa is going to say, the book is there, but it cannot have both natures at the same time. My mind, as an unenlightened being, can only comprehend the reality of the book as it's operating on my senses. An Arya, or a Buddha, who is fully enlightened, can see the book and see that it is empty of its inherent nature, see that it is lacking causes and conditions that create it as a book beyond what my ability to say, this book is the result of causes and conditions. So inherent existence, when we want to say dependent arising, is the other side of the coin of it. We can say that from Nagarjuna's opinion. If we look at Chandrakirti, we're going to say that they're two different things. So if we have dependent arising, things come up from causes and conditions. The reason that this is a book, and I see this as a book, is that there's someone who wrote the book. There's someone who put ink on the page, who copied the pages. There was a tree that was felled that was pulped and made into paper. There was, you know, whatever kind of glue this is, whatever kind of thread this came from. All of these things bring up this book, and that would be a dependent arising. But without those things, there's no book. And that would be a lack of inherent existence. Does that answer your question? Partially. Partial answer. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the inherent existence of the book? How does it exist by itself? A classic. Hang on. A classic example is a table. If you have a table with a top and four legs, but you take apart that table, do you still have a table? You, you have four straight pieces of wood and a longer rectangular piece of wood, perhaps. The example that comes up a lot in the text is a chariot. There's many different ways that we could put together the parts of a chariot. But if it's all taken apart, is it a chariot? Can we hitch a horse to those parts and go? No. So if we take part every page and every piece of this book, do we end up with just a pile of glue shavings, some thread, some pieces of paper? Is that a book? No. Yes. Yeah. Is it a book potential? Maybe. We don't know. But if we tr try to apply the potentiality of the book in that way to people, to individuals, then we see that that's not actually possible. And by this, I mean that if we take each of our aspects of our emotional life, our thinking lives, how we think, how we do that, how we would describe ourselves, oh, I'm, I'm a happy-go-lucky sort of person, and I, you know, I'm not very smart, but I'm okay those individual parts don't necessarily make a person. But when they're combined together, that's a person. That's someone that we can say, oh, that's Autumn. That's, you know, that's Bill. That's Patty. Those are the parts that we're talking about when we talk about that person. But individually, we can't find where someone is smart. We can't find where someone is happy. Just like if I have an individual page, I can't say that it's a book. So there's some more questions or comments. I don't know if it was so much a question, but I was just thinking of the example that sometimes they use, like if a dog comes into the room, the dog doesn't see the book. So this is there's an example no, of a dog's yeah, perceptions. So there's an object, the dog sees a chew toy. Yeah, dog doesn't see a book, dog sees a chew toy. Exactly. and. The dog's perceptions are actually different from ours. So the world that we live in 
is based on our own perceptions. If we were a fly, we would see the world very differently. A dog cognizes the world more by scent rather than by visual forms. So that's a very different world. It's a world that I can't really imagine. But for that dog, that's the conventional reality of the dog. If we take our sense of visual sight being very strong for most of us, the dog's sense of smell, these are two very different objects. I mean, I don't know doesn't smell very interesting to me, but maybe a dog would think it's very interesting and want to smell it all the time. Whereas I think it's very interesting to look at and to read because my perception of reading is how I find out more about the book. Dog might be more interested in where it came from or who handled it. And those perceptions are then our conventional reality. If we look at both of them together, we don't know what this is. It by itself doesn't exist. There's another comment over here. So, I'm not trying to muddy the water, but does this muddy the water if I ask about conventional versus unconventional truth? If there is involved a sentient being, meaning you're walking and you see something on the trail and you're like, it's a snake, and then it doesn't move and you're like, it's a snake. But, or what if it is a snake? So that's always been my rabbit. So the question is that what does it exist on its own? Hang on. So the question is, uh, does this involve sentient versus non-sentient beings? And the example given is you're walking on a trail and you see something there and you think, oh, it's a snake. Oh, it's a stick. That's part of our conventional reality. That is our misconceived misconceptions. That's the illusion of that stick looking like a snake. So that's our conventional reality. And we can make mistakes. We can have cognitive errors. And that's fine. That doesn't mean that that's going to give us knowledge. So that's why it's important to know about, you know, proper valid cognition. That would be an, an example of an illusion or a misconception. So the the thought that our conventional reality is something that we can rely on for knowledge, we can to a point, but we need to have valid cognition. We need to know what valid cognition is, what SEMA is. And that is, I'm going to say, beyond the scope of what I can actually go into today, because <laughs> that is... Most of the books written over there have conventional reality or, or valid cognition as the topic, if you just want to break it down in that way. So it that's a big topic. But that is the conventional reality. The ultimate reality wouldn't change, right? The ultimate reality of what that object is doesn't change based on our misconception of it. Unless you're looking at the one version of one interpretation of Chandra Kirti, which says that it's the mind which looks at things that gets you to conventional reality. But again, that's not going to be valid cognition because you clearly made an erroneous assumption or erroneous perception of that object as either a snake or a stick, depending on what it is or what you later change your understanding of it as based on more perceptual cognitions. Another comment over here, maybe? Comments or questions from, oh, okay. So how does the result of the view feel subjectively? And following this up, how does perception of your own body feel after realizing this? Uh, so, so the first, part, this is from the same person. How does the, the result of this view feel subjectively? And follow up on this. How does perception of your own body feel after realizing this? Your perceptions don't change. So basically what we're saying is that we have a subjective reality, which we're going to call um, conventional reality, mundane reality. And that is subjected to us 
to an extent. So my view of what happened this morning when someone cut me off on the road is subjective and conventional. It's based on my perceptions of what happened. The person who cut me off might think that I was trying to invade into their lane and that I was actually endangering them. So they have a different perception, a different cognition of what happened. And that's why the, the idea of valid cognition is actually really important. Um, but I think in that situation, we could say that um, the, the reality that I experienced is simply how I experienced it. And there may not actually be an objective truth. This is where I can't really say very much because how we actually deal with objective truths as we know them colloquially is not going to be the same as how we're dealing with conventional reality and ultimate reality. Okay, so you sort of have to take a moment and say, when we talk about things, we're talking in this sphere and we're talking about objective truths or unobjective truths or knowledge from our conventional side. And ultimately, those truths are going to be different. So you can't combine both of them when we're talking colloquially very easily. And that's where you get into Shanakirti's view and the differences between Sankapa and Goramba, which is whether or not we are actually experiencing things because they are falsely presented to us or we're experiencing them because we have a false mind about them. And those are two separate views. So if our mind, if our cognition is saying this is a book, and it is a book, but our mind is also saying that this is a book, and it's not, then my cognition of that is an error. Versus, I see this as a book, but, uh, you know, let's say I see it as a blue book. Well, that could be a falsely presented cognition from the object, right? So how we uh, see the world is going to be incorrect versus how we cognize the world being incorrect. Come. It's so interesting. I'm just going to sort of repeat what you say for Zoom. <laughs> No, yeah, <laughs> we are having a moment. So, let me get out of here. so we attribute conventional truth for conventional truth. There's functionality. There's functionality. We attribute yeah. functionality, and that's how we know it as convention. Um, yeah. yeah, let's. Can we just pass out the mic? Because I think this is going to get all right. So. Cool. Conventional truth, the object has an attributed functionality. Without that, when it's breaking apart, it's not, it, uh, it doesn't exist from its own side. It's still, the parts of it exist, but not as the thing that we conceive it like a book. Okay. So, what was interesting also is that if you say that if you perceive it as uh, let's say a blue book when it's a red book your cognition is wrong so then we're so in that world of attributing functionality it seems to also be an interdependent sort of uh, agreement of what we ascribe certain characteristics to things so this is actually where we get into the world of concepts and more into Dharma Kirti um, and how we actually have these agreements to be able to use language. So our, our book is only a book because we've decided collectively to call it a book, right? Is this a thermos? Is this a cup? Is this a mug? Conceptually, we know what it is. Linguistically, we may have some difficulties describing it, but how we 
get to our ability to talk about things in general concepts versus particulars, this is very much into Dharmakirti, um, is a way of how we talk about conventional reality. So the, the use of our interdependence in our agreements on what things are and how to talk about them is different from what we're actually trying to get at with the two truths, with ultimate and conventional truth. Conventional truth relies on us. Ultimate truth does not. Does that make sense? Yes. Can you just give them the microphone, please? <laughs> Isn't all cognition dualistic and therefore relative truth? What's right? If you have to have a cognizer and an object that's cognized, right? So you always have this, this sort of relativistic point of view, right? That's what's going on with cognition. How can you have cognition without a cognizer and a cognized object? So this is where we get into the different uh, interpretations of Chandrakirti. Garabha is going to say that if we're talking about ultimate truth, then only regular beings see the objects as subjective in that way. Enlightened beings only see the ultimate truth, the inherent inexistence of things. So when we talk about subjects and objects, you have to also think back to what we said about Nagarjuna is that we have two truths. And this is the uh, say it, the dependent arising of both selflessness and phenomena. So both self, both the me that I want to say is me is also conventional and ultimate, right? So conventionally, I can talk about myself, I can talk about my cup, I can talk about my feelings, but ultimately, there's no me. And then with things, again, we have things and then we have, they don't, they lack inherent existence. So when we try to uh, define things by subject and object, we're already in only the world of conventional truth. We're only there. We're not actually going into ultimate truth. So if I'm going to define these as different, me and the book is different, then I'm only talking in conventional truth. I can say how things dependently arise based on causes and conditions. But those causes and conditions we have to be very careful with because we don't want to allow for an infinite regress. That's logically incoherent, that everything has a cause and condition, right? I mean, we could talk about the worms that ate the body, that ate the, the chicken, that ate the seaweed, you know, a million years ago, and how we got the book. Well, that's great, but that doesn't give us any knowledge about the book itself. It doesn't give us any knowledge about what's written on the pages. So being very careful about those things and avoiding the, avoiding the two extremes of everything exists as I see it and nothing exists because there's just nothing there. There's no causes and conditions. There's no inherent existence to anything, which are both found in different philosophical positions. That's why we have the middle way. That's why we have the, it's empty from its own side, but it dependently arises. And if you want to think of those as two sides of the same coin, then you're within Nargajuna's camp. If you don't, that's okay. There's other ways to think of them existing together or existing separately based on the mind that's cognizing them. Uh, Another comment from Zoom is maybe purity seems like a better word because things clearly appear. Non-existence gives nihilistic impressions. So 
if the idea is that purity is something that's objective or purity uh, rather than not, hmm. I'm not exactly sure if this comment is based about um, ultimate existence or uh, conventional existence. Uh, and then Charlotte says it's not non-existence, it's lack of inherent existence. And that is correct. We're not talking about things that aren't existing because those are different, completely different category of existence versus non-existence. And those are going to be conventional. So you can think of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, right? Just think. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, what do you see? That is a thought. And that thought is of a non-existent thing. Does that make sense? OK. So the non-existent thing comes from a song or a picture or a drug out, whatever. However you want to think about where the song came from, that is a causing condition of that image in your head now of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I'm seeing a lot of confused faces, which is what I expected. <laughs> Here's the giant caveat to all of this, is that conventional and ultimate truth is not easy. It's not easy to think about. It's not easy to try to define. It's not easy to try to even... What some would say is that ultimate truth is undefinable. So I'm trying to give you a taster. I'm trying to give you some of the textual uh, ways of thinking about this. And maybe I'm not doing a very good job of it, and that's okay. I'm fine with that. Uh, but the general sense is that this is something that you have to think about and spend years on. When Contra and Prashay was here last time, he said, at one point, I wasn't making any progress on understanding the two truths. And my teacher told me to take a break from meditating on it. And he took a break for three years. So just consider that that this is a taster. This might be brand new for some of you. Um, for some of us, I, I couldn't get enough of reading about this stuff. Um, whether or not I actually grasp it or have any realization of it is, you know, whatever. Uh, I just find it really interesting to think about how we think about things existing. And then does that thing actually have that existence that I think it, it does? Um, and how is it that I'm cognizing what's happening in my daily life is all interpreted through my own experience, my own faculties, my own thoughts and conceptions, and that what happened has a totally dis different existence from what I think happened or what is has a totally different existence from what I think is. And we're saying that there's no inherent existence in the book because everything I have to say about the book is based on my interpretation and my causes and conditions and my human existence. So that's what I find really interesting about this. And the result of this, the purpose of this, is what is suffering suffering is only the truth of suffering is only through our own interpretation our causes and conditions how we view things and that's seeing the lack of inherent existence of suffering is how we escape it that's where this goes but there's so many different steps in so many different places did you just say that's how we escape it that's how we escape suffering, yeah. That's I'm just having problems with the word escape. That's okay. Escape is used loosely at the moment. So you're saying 
So yeah, that that was where I was going to ask is like, so what does this mean to me personally in my mundane existence? And but I don't, I don't, yeah. It's the the understanding of conventional truth you're saying is a way of escaping suffering. No, is that what, that's not it's the ultimate truth that allows us to escape suffering. Hmm? Tell us why the word escape is. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I, I wonder if on a... unenlightened i mean you have yeah on an unenlightened level you can ever really escape suffering no matter how much you understand intellectually right so yeah i think yeah escape is probably the, the wrong word but transcend except Hmm. I'm not sure I'd take accept as as transcend. I can probably go with. What's the difference between transcend and escape? But that's so fleeting, right? Why? Because we're not Aryas, or at least I'm not. No, oh, that's the idea of getting to be one. Huh? That's that's sort of the idea. In and Sankaba says that you can hold both conventional truth and ultimate truth with an ordinary mind you don't have to be an aria to be that it might make you one garaba says no only arias can see ultimate truth only arias have that mind but arias then don't have conventional truth also they don't have that mind so garaba says they're two separate beings two separate minds so kappa says no it's the thing itself that holds both natures, ultimate and conventional, and therefore any sentient being can see it. So they're both within the tradition. So I have a comment. So um, I see Lucy in the sky is real, and I am grasping at Lucy in the sky. And I'm completely involved and like this image is real. And like, and so like I'm going about my life. Oh, there's Lucy. I see an image of Lucy and I'm grasping. And so this philosophy to me is it starts to break down that idea. And at first it says, maybe Lucy isn't real. And then little by little, like there's some separation between like the grasping and the reality. And then my suffering kind of diminishes a little bit. Your suffering of what? My suffering of the grasping at this mm -hmm. this image that isn't real. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe with this philosophy, you start to say, hey, maybe there's a lot of things that I'm looking at in this world that aren't necessarily like real images that that like, you know, I'm I'm grasping at. And so little by little, there's some separation. I think with that separation, suffering kind of diminishes a little bit. So that's that's the, how I practically relate to. And and uh, and it's I mean the problem is, is that there's so much complexity, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to understand it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could take this and we could start with how do things exist in a very different way and talk about years of philosophy of just how things exist or could exist. We could talk about years, uh, it just years. We could talk for how minds exist and which mind does what and what type of consciousnesses we have. So. This is just a little taster. This is just trying to start your thinking. And when you have questions and confusion, please talk to Lama or someone else, not me. <laughs> All right, cause it, here's the thing is that, you know, if you want to call it creating uh, space or escaping or whatever it is, um, having a wrong view about ultimate and conventional truth can lead you down a nasty path of being more confused. And when Lama first introduced this, I was confused as hell. I had no idea. And then when you try to 
talk about it, it gets more confusing. And then you go back to the text and you go back and forth and slowly you get up each rung of the ladder. Um, hopefully you get up with each rung of the ladder. Uh, but the, the idea that this is easy, it's not easy. So, you know, take it, take that as a, a warning of, um, when you start dealing with conventional and ultimate truths and how things exist, it's a deep hole. It's a, it takes a long time to think about, and it takes a long time to start to maybe understand, even just intellectually understand, and not even have realizations of it. I think I have a couple more questions here. Is it on now? Yes. I think <clears throat> you're right. This is a deep, deep hole, right? And I think sometimes when there's all this, you know, depth to take years to unravel, right? I feel like there's a lot of threads that you could pull at and to try to figure this out. But I think sometimes um, I'm kind of going back to what Brad said and and what you said earlier, Connor, is I think about it in the sense of in the everyday Buddhism in the streets, what makes me think this about is that everyone has their own cognizer and everyone is perceiving everything as from their own selves. And I just think I have to remember that because what you're perceiving may not be what I'm perceiving and I'm judging you on what I'm perceiving and you're judging me on what you perceive. And so I think how I come to this in a daily basis is just to allow for grace and space to recognize that what you're looking at, just the example you gave, you know, you're on your scooter and you're like, did they think I was invading their lane? I thought you were invading my lane. Like, that's why I honked at you, you know? And, and so I just think, I don't know what they think, but I know it's probably different than what I think. And so I'm just going to allow for that grace and just be, and allow for that space and just be okay with that. I don't know. That's what I, that's what I take away when I think about what does this mean when I leave here, how do how does how do I operate with this knowledge in a daily basis? Yes, I would say make sure that you also understand that that's only the conventional, mundane reality. I think we've got maybe two more. I really appreciate being able to listen to this conversation and to participate in it as well. Because like everybody's saying, this is a deep, deep hole and it's full of treasures, you know? And so if you're afraid of dropping into the hole, <laughs> you're gonna miss out on the treasures. So um, having this conversation, I, I hear what, your name is Brad? Brad. Yeah, what, what you're saying is very similar to my experience as well, where sometimes you, um, try something on a little bit, you know, it's like trying on is, is Lucy in the sky is real. And, you know, that's like 99.9% .9 of my day, Lucy in the sky is real. And that other five, you know, 0.5%, once in a while, the red flag goes up and I go, uh Oh, is it, you know, what is it, How does it actually exist? And so trying on that 0.5%, hopefully it'll turn into 1% some year, you know, and um, being able to talk about it and be creative about how we're seeing things and being able to let go of an idea for long enough to see what's, you know, if you see something bigger than that, if you're seeing a stick or a snake, you know, or whatever. And so I think it's been very valuable for me to be able to hear everybody's perspectives that have spoken up. And um, so thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I had a question. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but is that idea of the tetralemma useful in trying to find out kind of the middle way of how to see these? Um, yes. You know, I mean... When you have... Whatever is dependently co-arisen, whatever explained by that is explained by emptiness, 
that being a dependent designation is itself the middle way. Um, and then uh, let me see if I can find it so I can read it directly. Neither from itself, nor from another, nor from both, nor without a cause does anything whatsoever anywhere arise. So that's both Nurgajuna. Um And if you want to think about causes, if you want to think about things that... The only ways that things can exist is from itself, from another, or from both. How else could something else, something exist? And that's where we get ultimate reality. The relationship between causes and effects. So, yeah, you've got tetralimus, you've got different ways of looking at it. You've got Shantakirti's interpretations. I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly, but um, when I think about this topic, I think about uh, how all I really know is that I've had an experience with something. And um, like you're saying, I, I even recognize with like the idea of the book that not only is our experience colored by what we think it is, but even the emotional attachment that we have to it. Somebody might look at the book and think, oh, I can't wait to read it. Another person would think, oh, that makes a good doorstop. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Nobody heard me. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Sorry, Zoom. We're going to just sort of jump in here. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so as I was saying, I want some of the people on online to understand that, that all we can really trust is ex our experience, that we've had an experience with something, uh, and that the what we attribute meaning to all of those things that give us or contribute to that experience, that and they may not actually be what we've convinced ourselves that they are. All we really know is that we had that experience. And this is about looking back at what caused us to think that that was there to give us that experience. This is my way of trying to understand what we're saying here. So you had an experience, someone cut you off. They had an experience that you moved into their lane. Um, all you know is that you had that experience and then trying to understand what we what we want to believe is the reality behind that is uh, all really based on story. There kind of isn't reality behind that. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, uh, when we think about experiences, um, and this is actually the point that when you start to read Chandra Kirti and we get into the commentaries on that, our experiences are different from whatever point of mind we're looking at them. Is it uh, a point of mind from meditative equipoise or is it a point of mind from phenomenal experience? Just a mundane, this is our everyday life. Or is this our, our analytical mind, for lack of a better term right now? Um, and that's the, the difference in interpretation of Chandra Kirti. Both are within the tradition, though, which is interesting. Yeah, perspectives. What's an example of an ultimate truth? That things have no inherent existence. They don't exist from their own side. Any further questions? Maybe one more question or comment? Thank you, thank you, Connor. You know, I, I, I didn't know what this talk would be like, but I found it to be, like, just, just wonderful, and I'm just taking it all in, and it's really been so helpful to me. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, you're welcome. So, hopefully, your experiences with. Clarity and confusion will now become more uh, resultant to you. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and wrap up.
I appreciate you guys all listening to my dribble for the last hour. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do uh, closing prayers now. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezi, Chen Zing Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholder of the teachings remain forever. And may all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Sang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire hosts of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sahijas. Lo Sangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. All right. Are there any announcements? <laughs> Damn it, Patty. <laughs> so uh, on Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, we have expressions. That's music, art, and poetry, if you haven't, uh, if you don't know. And it starts at 7 o'clock on Friday. And then um, also we have uh, a men's group following um, Dharma dudes, <laughs> following this service. And... Um, and then uh, we have a recovery group on Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving as well at six. And finally, um, one the others might have an announcement. I have a food drive. Um, it's not, uh, you see a little basket there if you want to contribute. I think it's going to be ongoing for always. Like if you bring food, we'll make it, we'll find a person that needs it or a group that needs it. And um, on Thursday, which is Thanksgiving at seven o'clock, uh, there'll be meditation here and also pie. <laughs> Just for those interested, Lama will be uh, teaching this Monday at entering the path at 630. So just FYI. And I think uh, Buddha did more than just invent a philosophy and teachings he invented job security for all of his successors all right thanks can we get some more uh, lucy and, and have a little reprieve of that all right Bouncing. oh my.